uh, to our next session, which is on China brands uh, going global and uh, how they're going about it and the challenges they face. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Vijay uh, from The Economist, who is going to be our moderator, uh, as well as, uh, thank you Vijay, um, we met in uh, Shanghai and Beijing, and uh, Vijay is moderated our, at our events in uh, China, and we welcome him here now that he's back in New York. Uh, so say hi to Vijay. Um, okay, next, um, Peter Prontemou from RacePoint Global. Uh, so, uh, President and CEO of RacePoint Global uh, will be giving us a perspective. Uh, Donovan Song from uh, Xiaomi, we've heard a little bit about him already. Uh, and finally, Adam Lisper from DJI, uh, the world's leading drone maker made in China, designed in China. Uh, VJ, take it away, please. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great uh, honor to follow uh, my colleague, the distinguished author you just met, has a day job working for The Economist across the road at 753rd Avenue, as it turns out, where we hang our hats, so we're very proud of her. Um, but today, uh, we are here on this panel, a distinguished panel, to talk about China and global brands. And now we all know that China has extraordinary um, uh, manufacturing. China has been the workshop to the world for several decades. Uh, we all know that not only from low-end manufacturing to uh, the iPhones you have in your pockets and other high-quality manufacturing, but one thing that has been uh, uh, less noticeable is the advance of Chinese brands on the global stage, with the notable exception of, let's say, Lenovo, which is very early on. Uh, I think most people outside this room in New York would be hard-pressed to name a Chinese brand that they regularly interact with in their country. Uh, Alibaba everyone's heard about, but not many Americans use Alibaba yet. So um, this may change. And in fact, in Southeast Asia, in India, in, in Latin America, in parts of Europe, this has already been changing at very rapid speed. Uh, if there's one thing you take away from our uh, earlier speaker, Hans, uh, who uh, will return shortly to the stage for the competition, uh, it is just the breathtaking speed of change in China, which I saw myself as uh, the China business editor for The Economist over the last five years. I've only recently come back to the US and amazed at how slow and kind of fallen apart things are here uh, in comparison. So uh, we have uh, representatives here. And, and I want to start first with uh, a company that is a real trendsetter, at DJI, um, uh, the world's leading drone manufacturer, uh, which has uh, perhaps, based on third party estimates, 70% market share in uh, uh, drones, in the kind of drones that uh, you and I would buy or that uh, companies might use, not the military drones, of course, that are used to bomb people in the Middle East. Um, your nice drones, if we can, uh, if we can, if we can start with Adam. We agree. Uh, can you tell us, uh, DJI uh, has had an extraordinary success in market penetration, um, but we're here to talk about branding. And so can you tell me how you think about branding uh, of course, the, the proper name for your company is Da Jiang, uh, but you go by DJI, and that, maybe that's a clue uh, yeah. as to how to your international success. Chinese names are hard for people to pronounce outside China, right? Uh, it's uh, let's just say it, say it what it is, uh, and uh, which is why those of you who know Lenovo is actually uh, Liang Xian. You know, they, they used a, a made-up name, Lenovo, when they took on IBM's PC business, which was a stroke of marketing genius, one could argue, so people could pronounce their name outside China. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think about branding and going global? Uh, and we can talk a little bit more, of course, about some of the other things, but let's start with that. Sure, yeah. I was not at DJI when the decision was made to have the global name of the company be DJI, as opposed to something that, you're right, unfortunately, Americans are confused about how to pronounce Xiaomi or Huawei. And, and I'm probably pronouncing them both wrong, too. Um, you know, one of the big advantages DJI has had is that we're a company focused on innovation from the very start. Nobody sat down and said, how can we come up with a billion dollar idea? How can we come up with a, uh, what can we build into a global company? It was a bunch of guys who got really excited about building, not even drones yet, just flight control technologies and transmitters and the technical guts that go into drones. And as they built great components, they said, hey, we could actually make kit you could just build yourself into a drone and as that caught on like wildfire so we could just build a drone and take out of the box and fly and suddenly um, this built on itself and as a result we had a rabid fan base from the beginning 
that knew us as DJI, they didn't necessarily know that or care that we were Chinese. You know, perhaps if there was something they had to send back for customer service, it was a pain to send it back to China in the early days or to find an American or, uh, or a European representative, as the case may be. Um, but the, it, this was uh, never a company with a business plan that you could take out of a, 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 a textbook and check off what you were going to do with it. It was built on coming up with something extraordinarily new and innovative. Um, uh, getting it to people who could really appreciate it. And for the longest time, we have our, our public messaging has followed in that. It's the brand that represents the product and what you can do with it. We don't have a lot of feature or, or people-based advertising, marketing, paid content, et cetera. You don't see our senior executives being interviewed all over the place. Um, I, you know, I have friends in the PR business who would give their right arm to have their CEOs quoted in some of the places that we routinely turn down. It's a stylistic choice, but it reflects the emphasis within our company on innovation, coming up with new ideas, not on what somebody is saying sitting up on a stage holding a microphone. Great. So uh, we get a picture of a company that's led by product, by innovation, but also, um, uh, in a sense, uh, think, started to think globally from day one. Uh, in part because there wasn't a drone market really, a commercial drone market for you to sell into China. There were enthusiasts, of course, in the West already. There was an addressable market. So uh, I, I think of DJI as something of a micro multinational, a new breed of companies that could not have launched 20 years ago, let's say, without the access to the internet, to uh, ra rapid financing, to global flows of talent and, and so on. And in the case of your firm, uh, I was one of the rare journalists who did get to not only visit, but interview your founder, who's still a very young man. He is a mainlander, but he studied in Hong Kong, is a sort of a textbook case of uh, uh, how rising Chinese entrepreneurs uh, think globally and, and return to China, but with global ambitions and global mindset. And so that's that's a little glimpse. We'll come back to you in a, in a moment. Um, the, the flavor of the moment, I think, in, uh, in Chinese technology is going to be uh, Xiaomi. Your company has, uh, Donovan, uh, an IPO coming up, and, uh, and Hans has talked you up enough. Uh, we, don't need to, we don't need to do that, but let's, let's, let's get right to the heart of it. Uh, can you tell us, when we talk about branding, uh, uh, you know, Xiaomi is a, uh, had a great success so far in India. I think you're number one in the Indian market for smartphones. Uh, you've had a good penetration in Southeast Asia. Uh, but you know there were rocky points along the way. It wasn't uh, the easiest high way to get there. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how your international journey, yes. particularly again thinking about branding, marketing, and how do you persuade uh, countries that have lots of smartphone options? Frankly, there's smartphone saturation in lots of countries that they should take a chance on an, uh, for them an unproven Chinese brand. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, so I've been at Xiaomi for uh, almost four years now. Uh, when I first joined Xiaomi, uh, we had just started to go international into a couple of markets, uh, India, Singapore. Uh, fast forward four years, uh, we're now in 74 markets and countries worldwide. Uh, we have now uh, become number one in India, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, just three years after entering the India market, uh, we're now number one in smartphones. The latest IDC report has us with over 30% market share uh, in India. Uh, so this is the first time in many years uh, that, a, that a new brand has become number one in India. Uh, it's not just India. Uh, in Southeast Asia, we've been expanding quite aggressively. So in Indonesia, um, just a few years in, uh, we're now number two in the market in terms of smartphones. Uh, and globally, we're in, in the top five in over 15 global markets. Uh, some people have wondered if the Xiaomi model uh, can also be replicated uh, in Western markets. Uh, so six months ago, uh, I was in Spain, uh, the very first time that we entered a Western market, uh, which is Spain. Uh, and in just six short months, we've gone from nothing to number three in the market. A few weeks ago, uh, I was in uh, Paris and Milan. Uh, so we've now officially entered uh, France and Italy as well. Uh, and we're very confident in our model there. So just before you proceed, you, you referred to your model. Can you just tell us uh, what do you consider to be the Xiaomi business model yeah, or market entry model? Yeah, you know, a lot of people ask us, how did we go from, you know, nothing to such uh, large sort of revenue numbers and uh, sales numbers so quickly? Uh, and we think uh, one of the key points is our pretty unique business model, right? Uh, when it comes to selling hardware, first of all, we sell much more than just smartphones. Uh, we also sell uh, IoT products, things like scooters. Internet of Things, of uh, course. Yes, scooters, uh, TVs, uh, you know, Mi Bands. Uh, power banks, fitness bands, actually, that are yeah. one of the best sellers. 
So we've invested in uh, over 90 what we call portfolio companies uh, that help us to make these products. And we have over 16, uh, 1,600 SKUs already. All of these products uh, you may have seen pretty recently that we announced we will forever limit the net hardware profit margin on these products to within 5%. And anything above 5% will return as excess uh, to our users. So what, what well, ends up happening? A, why is that a good thing to say to prospective investors in your IPO? <laughs> that sounds like a really bad thing to say. Uh, I'll, I'll answer the business model question. So uh, it's us saying that uh, we're not just a hardware company. Uh, we sell amazing hardware that is usually better or the same specs as other competitors, but half the price. It's actually a very simple marketing message. Uh, and we often say our product is the marketing. So. Uh, with this model, uh, the question maybe is a little bit more like, how could you not win uh, when you enter markets like Indonesia or India? You know, who doesn't want something that's better quality for half the price? And the reason is because we're actually an internet company. Actually, all of these hardware tools are just an acquisition funnel for us to acquire users, which is ultimately what internet companies care about. And then we can provide them with a lot of interesting internet services, things like app stores, browsers, content, uh, financial payments, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, you can check the details in the prospectus that we filed a few weeks ago, uh, but you can see that internet revenues, although they don't account for the majority of our revenues, they account for a substantial amount of our profits. So the reason we want to cap the profit margin from our hardware is because we want to show to the world forever that we're an internet company and we're looking to make our profit from internet revenues. Sure, that's really helpful. So in essence, um, you're one of the examples that I see as the best of Chinese um, frugal engineering, extremely high quality engineering products. And those of you who've used Xiaomi phones and fan, their fan base are really, really fanatical. People love Xiaomi phones who use Xiaomi phones, um, are very high quality and your price point is often very close to break even. I remember a couple of years ago when I wrote about Xiaomi from China, I looked into the margins and um, at that time anyway, you're making more money on the little mascot dolls that you sold through your internet service than on, on a handset uh, by design. You wanted to, and because you had this vision of a services model revenue stream and so on. So that gives us an idea of how you are able to enter. Uh, obviously you have to execute well, and you know, I can say I'm gonna be very great and cheap and just, I will win, but I have to execute. Um, I still wanna know about branding though. Yes. I mean, it's a great marketing strategy to start by saying we're the best phone at the lowest price. That's a great, but uh, is that really what your ads say in India, for example, or in uh, Singapore? I suspect not. So then give us a sense of what is the, how do you connect with the consumer? What's the value proposition? Where's your brand equity? How do you think about that? So I think one very key thing about Xiaomi is, uh, sure, you know, maybe it has a hard to pronounce Chinese name, but, but actually if you look at these sounds, they're, they're all sounds that you see in English, right? Xiao like in shower, me like me. So it's actually quite, quite an easy name to say. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, 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 all right, let's, let's just, okay, let's take a, a show of hands. Uh, first of all, how many people here have Xiaomi phones or have used one? Okay, so we got about maybe 10, 20%. Uh, how many people um, uh, can pronounce Xiaomi properly? Hands up. This is obvious. So how many of you think your most? How many of you think your most American friend could also produce Xiaomi, pronounce Xiaomi properly? Your most non-traveled native, nativist American friend. Okay, I got it. So I, I guess what I would say. Is, back there. I guess what I would say is, um, I think you know, it's not common in English to see an X in the front That's um, what of, a, of a letter. Absolutely. Uh, what I meant was the actual syllables themselves sure. are, are easy to pronounce. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, um, you know, Hans talked a lot today about the rise of China. You know, I do think that um, as more and more Chinese companies go global, like Xiaomi. Uh, it, it'll just be very normal. You'll notice a lot of the sounds are actually very similar. They exist in English. You just have to be able to read it. Uh, but anyway, back to the marketing question. Uh, I think one key thing about Xiaomi uh, is that we really focus on product quality. We believe that the product can speak for itself. Um, you know, if you end up using one of our phones, whether um, you know the the Mi 8 or the Mi, you know the Mi Mix 2s or things like that, you'll see that these are not cheap products. I think one thing that helps that we're trying to change is. The idea that a Chinese product, that a uh, low cost product must be a low quality product. Uh, we actually think that something can be low cost and also be very, very high quality. Um, because of our 5% pledge, you're right, we sell very, very close to cost. Which means that we have very low marketing costs. 
So we don't do a lot of traditional advertising things like TV ads and banner ads and you know billboard ads and things like that. Uh, we depend a lot on word of mouth. We have this uh, very cool mechanism called me fans, which are these super hardcore fans uh, around the world uh, who help to spread the word about Xiaomi. Uh, you know, there's very few companies in the world, uh, certainly very few Chinese companies in the world, that when you're trying to launch a new product or open a new store, you have hundreds of people lining up outside. 24 hours, 48 hours in advance. You know, when I went to France just a few weeks ago, I was actually shocked because in France, uh, in Paris, it ended up hailing the day that we had our launch event. And we also opened our first store. It was just raining cats and dogs, hailing, and we ended up having over 500 people line up outside who traveled from all over Paris, uh, France. So even if- so These weren't Chinese who were visiting or studying. The, the, no, they were all- of all, all backgrounds. Okay. BJ, BJ, I just want to ask, since you yeah. asked about India and Singapore, what can you tell the audience about what how Xiaomi customized the phone for India? Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, so as we've gone more global, uh, we've also, uh, this is sort of an interesting topic in terms of how Chinese companies go global. Uh, one of our key products, of course, is hardware products, right, in addition to software products. Uh, so uh, we have seen that certain markets have different needs than the Chinese market. So for the Indian market, uh, the average temperature is a lot hotter than in China. And the, one of the biggest uh, worries that a lot of Indian users have is the phone overheating. Uh, so what we've done in India is we have, uh, in all of our phones there now, uh, we've built uh, what we call a dual pyrolytic graphite sheet. It's just a separate material that goes inside the phone and reduces the average temperature by up to two Celsius. Uh, so the phone doesn't overheat. Indian users love it. Uh, another very small example I can mention is that in India, there's often a lot of power surges. Uh, so if your phone is plugged in, uh, you, you may know this. Uh, too true. Too very true. easy for the phone to burn out. So we've created a special adapter that you plug in. It's a 380 volt adapter that can withstand these power surges so your phone doesn't burn out. Uh, another interesting fact about India is that over 95% of our phones are manufactured locally in India. Made in India. So something obviously that Prime Minister Modi is a very, very big fan of, and of course, we're a big fan because a big part of our message is localizing and really being friends with our users. Um, just a couple of times you talked about me.com or me fans. Um, I've noticed the company uh, has dabbled with the idea of shortening Xiaomi yes. to just me and uh, in some of its international marketing. Uh, why don't you take the plunge? Just call yourself me outside of China or is there some pushback for you know cultural reasons why you don't want to do that? Uh, well, the name of the company is Xiaomi. You know, uh, it's, that, that's, that's the name of the company. That's how we've been talked about for eight years. Uh, but you're right that our global product brand uh, globally is me, uh, MI. Uh, we, we own mi.com, me.com. So it's very, very easy for uh, everyone in the world to pronounce that name. Uh, our phone here is called the Mi 8. Uh, you know, we have the Mi power banks, the Mi TV, things like that. Okay. Uh, and that helps to make it easier to spread the word. Uh, but the company's name is Xiaomi. Uh, and uh, we found that actually, maybe initially some people don't know how to pronounce it, but actually it, it's, it's quite an easy name uh, once people just understand the, uh, the All right then. Enough about me. <laughs> let's, let's, let's turn to Peter. Um, and you are, uh, uh, unlike our product innovators and branders, you are a branding expert. You're, you're uh, one of the leading thinkers in thinking about technology companies and brands. And uh, can you give us a little bit of your sage wisdom as we think about this question of Chinese innovators going global? And in particular, uh, how historically, I think one of your arguments is uh, companies have focused on sales, Chinese companies broadly, but less so on brand. And, and how is that changing, and what do Chinese companies need to do more to break into the big markets of the world with branding? I'll, I'll just, just push the button on the mic, and it works. Does this one work? Yeah. yeah. That was even they easier. all work, you just push the button. The so you have a green light. On. Oh, see, I was looking at a red light. A <laughs> uh, green light works. This should work. This I like the notion of sage, because I was going to describe myself as old and broken. Um, but this is better. Um, you know, I, I have spent a good deal of the last decade um, sort of studying how to work more effectively with Chinese brands um, and to bring them uh, to the market globally. Uh, we, my company wound up in, in China 10 years ago uh, off the back of uh, the fact that we had a large, fast-growing medical device company uh, whose largest growth opportunity was in, was in Asia and, uh, and principally in China. Uh, and so we acquired an agency in the market. And at the time, I thought it was going to be a very easy thing to take the technology brands that we were working with 
uh, in Western markets and, and bring them into the Chinese market um, and, and, and uh, sort of make all kinds of money in the process. Um, and what we learned very quickly was that that was not going to be an easy process, um, that, um, that the methods by which um, marketing were managed in China were different than they were in other markets in the world. Um, and so we, we, we took our strategy and turned it inside out and started focusing on how we could help Chinese brands to focus on Western markets. And uh, over time, we're hired by some of the largest brands in China uh, to help them with their, their strategies to come into Western markets. Um, so tell us a couple, a couple of things that work. Sure. I think, um, you know, I, I, I sort of come at this through three lenses. One is, um, how are you ready to deal with um, the deliberalization of global trade policy and what does that mean from a brand perspective? Two, how do you transform from a sales to a brand driven model? Because inevitably, um, if you look at the fastest growing companies, once they reach market peak and become the largest in their industry, quality tends to descend and they start to break down and lose market share. The auto sector is a good example of that but it's pretty much inevitable across a number of sectors. Uh, and three is, how do you start to manage brand in a world where basically 12 to 15 technology companies are re-establishing uh, um, the economic dynamics in the globe, the, uh, the banks in the US and then uh, the, you know, their brethren in China. Um, and so what we focus on are really items two and three. Number one, how to think about brands so when that inevitable crisis occurs or that potential downturn that you've got some brand equity in your back pocket and you can start to leverage that to ensure um, that you not only preserve market share but continue to be a market leader. Um, and right now my observation of the companies that we work with is that they're still doing a phenomenal job of growing off the back of quality um, and talking about quality and service, um, but ultimately um, they're going to need to look at uh, establishing some other kind of differentiation. And, and how, uh, just to press you a little bit further, um, what is it? Is it um, so-called brand advertising, traditional television? What works in the, the big markets around the world that you deal with that Chinese companies need to do more of? Or is it uh, viral? Is it online? Uh, what, what are the tools that they need to invest more in? Is it acquisition of talent, You know, getting the top MBA marketers from the top business schools that, that they don't have enough people with in-house knowledge. What is it you advise as a, you know, their advisor? I think it's thinking creatively in ways that no technology companies are thinking about right now, which is around this notion of the recapitalization of the economy. So you have these companies which have massive inflows of capital. The profit models are very different from old industrial companies. What the investor expectation is is very different. And yet the decision-making process doesn't necessarily reflect the opportunity and responsibility. So I would challenge companies to think about looking at, um, as you expand globally, look at markets that are actually suffering downturns and where the, the economy is, is, is not devastated, but certainly on its downside, and how you can come into that market and start to rebuild um, entire socioeconomic structures, how you can start to build brand uh, through being a good corporate citizen, job creation, um, and um, social impact, and everything that goes with it. You've got to have television, you've got to have broadcast to, to, to certainly build visibility. But you need to show you're a good citizen of the community. And in particular, I mean, it has to be said, this is a hostile environment for Chinese brands in America. Obviously, this is anyone who follows the news, Huawei has suffered the sharp end of the stick, ZTE recently. Uh, and so uh, when you are coming into markets, this establishing yourself as a good citizen or showing that you support local communities presumably can help with that. Absolutely. I mean, it lets you basically start to control the dialogue in a way you wouldn't otherwise. Um, ultimately, if you start to put product in the hands of, uh, of, of millennials um, and people who think about brand first, they're not going to necessarily consider the government relations impact, and all of a sudden you've got an army of people who are your supporters. So at the right time, you can start to activate them on behalf of your brand, uh, and that becomes a very powerful thing. The Internet's a beautiful thing for that. When I started offices in Washington, D.C. many years ago, all we focused on was letting citizens tell their stories about why they have loved a product. Right. When we wanted to influence somebody in Congress uh, or in a rulemaking body around a key vote, we would activate those tens of thousands of people who we had collected on the internet who stood for the product and put them to work on our behalf. And actually, turning that to, to uh, two other panelists, I think both your companies, actually, unusual, unusually amongst uh, many companies, are driven by very loyal users, and you have user bases for your products who you could mobilize in this way. Um, can you talk about, uh, all three of you, you, you raised a very interesting point, Peter, about uh, you know, sort of the, the fangs versus 
it's not really the BAT, maybe, I don't know where you put X in there, uh, Meituan, Tochia, there's, uh, we have to change the acronyms. But um, uh, the big Chinese uh, uh, technology companies, uh, in the markets that you're competing in, uh, when you have these uh, colossal companies, and you're both r rising stars, but we've got the big boys already, <clears throat> how do you see the competition emerging and where is the conflict and, and, and how do you handicap the race? I'll ask each of you to just give a thought on the FANGS versus BAT and how it affects your thinking at your company. I, I don't mean to duck this question, but we, we have the luxury right now, we never take this for granted, don't take this the wrong way, but because we have such a relatively large market share as reported by others, uh, since we never released it ourselves, um, we are in the enviable position of being able to de facto speak for an entire industry. There aren't a lot of people out there speaking on behalf of recreational drone pilots. Our competitors are, they don't have the sales to justify having an enormous policy team in Washington or building up a giant network of people who can go to the FAA and say, hey, wait, what's this proposal to make it illegal to fly in your backyard without installing a radar tracker, for example. So um, we have, the DJI has supported efforts that have created something called the Network of Drone Enthusiasts. If you like flying a drone, we don't care where you bought it, we don't care if you make it, made it yourself, but if you want to stick up for rational local drone policies, join Node, and we, we're supporting this effort to help others uh, figure out how to deal with local regulations. We're involved in other industry groups like that. We've led the global collection of data on people whose uh, lives have been saved by drones. We have just yesterday was the 134th person around the world confirmed rescued by a drone who otherwise would have been seriously injured or dead without a drone there to find them, rescue them, save them, bring them a life jacket, etc. We do efforts like that on our own dime. They benefit the whole thing. Anything bad about drones, there's a 70% chance it's ours. Anything good about drones, 70% chance it's ours as well. Right, right, okay. That's good, so you left the, the usage and users do the talking. You it's like your yeah, drones. And it's, it's putting the strategy that you described in action. No, when our when our users need the bat signal up there, you know, we'll shine the drone signal out online, <laughs> and they'll know that uh, the time has come. Otherwise, you're flying below the radar, just like your drones, right? <laughs> <laughs> Donovan, uh, a quick word from you. We're almost out of time. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah and how, on this. Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, before Xiaomi, I actually worked at uh, Spotify, Google, YouTube, Microsoft for many years. So, I have an insider view as well um, of of how those companies operate. Uh, I think with regards to Xiaomi. You I can't possibly be that old. I mean, uh, you must have started when you were in short pants. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think with regards to Xiaomi, uh, I think Xiaomi is quite a different company uh, from all of these companies, in addition to some of the Chinese equivalents. Uh, I mean, we're similar in that we're an internet company, and we have a lot of very active internet users. Um, but the way we acquire users is quite different. There's very few internet companies in the world, maybe none, that try to acquire users uh, through selling high quality, low cost hardware, and building our own channels. You know, Hans talked a lot about new retail. We've opened over 300 stores uh, in China, and one of the main things is that we sell these products for the same price in our offline stores as we do online, uh, all within this very, very small margin that we mentioned, much less than 5%. So I think it's a very unique model, uh, you know, of doing our own hardware, investing in a lot of companies in the ecosystem, building our own stores, we have over 200 stores globally, uh, you know, including in India and elsewhere, as well as doing our own internet services. So I think we're a very uh, different kind of company. Um, I think that the Chinese internet scene is changing quite rapidly. Maybe there was a time when people thought it was just these three companies, but there's actually a lot of other companies and a lot of chances. So we think Xiaomi uh, is very different. All right, well, I'm, I'm getting the signal from Rebecca, so we're gonna bring this to a close, just with a closing thought that uh, I think what you're seeing here is, is clearly um, uh, a, a very uh, extraordinary moment in terms of Chinese technology companies going overseas. Challenges to be sure, but uh, really uh, hopeful and uh, quite experimental and innovative kinds of business models that are driving them. So expect to hear more around the world from China's brands. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much.